Okay, welcome back. We can start, and I think we'll just start with questions from the last period, if you have any. Yes, um, I have one. Um, so last time we talked about uh, infective dose of pathogen, and yes. you said um, for the when the pathogen is locally acting, small dose is fine, but when the pathogen is like distantly working, then large dose is needed. And I was wondering whether you look at the variability in uh, pathogenic potency. Like, is there any difference between like the potency? You mean um, how much damage the pathogen causes to the host? Mm -hmm. um, I don't. I don't know that there's any distinction, but I didn't look carefully at that. So that's a good question. There were definitely um, severe pathogens in both classes. Um, there was a paper written sometime later that looked at a wider set of pathogens and they, but they didn't, I don't know that they look specifically at pathogenicity. So that's a good question. And I don't know that anybody's looked at this, um, but it could be, I haven't really followed up in the literature but I know that there's been a lot of articles in the last uh, three or four years where people have followed up on the idea. So you could um, easily trace the literature for the most recent publications. Um, if you just started with the paper that we wrote and just looked at Google Scholar for something published in the last couple of years, you'll see a lot of papers. So I don't know the answer, but I, I haven't noticed that I, we, we didn't Certainly, again, as I said, there's severe pathogens in both classes, but there could be. Um, you could easily imagine that the ones especially acting at a distance are really manipulating the hosts much more profoundly at a physiological level, whereas the locally acting ones um, are usually just initially influencing a local piece of tissue. They change, pathogens change as they invade and they spread in the body, they turn on different factors. So this is one of the, to me, one of the interesting aspects of the subject is to understand how a pathogen turns on and off different factors that manipulate the host in the different phases of disease. So for example, anthrax is very interesting. Um, anthrax doesn't make you very sick until your body completely fills up with bacteria so that you have as many as 10 to the eighth bacterial cells per milliliter of blood. It's a lot. And then it turns on some virulence factors, which basically liquefy you um, very suddenly. So you go from being, oh, I don't feel so good. Maybe I have a fever, a cold. And then all of a sudden, the pathogen in a coordinated way just turns on these virulence factors and um, you die very fast. It's very severe. And you can possibly understand why they do that because um, anthrax is transmitted through airborne pathogens and it kills mammals. And so you can find um, dead mammals, carcasses that are just totally full of this anthrax spores and they're dispersing them through the air. So it's, it's a very interesting subject because you can look at the life history stages of an infection and look at the ways pathogens turn on and off different factors. And so my actual interest in the subject actually came from that broader life history question of how pathogens turn on and off different factors in different stages of infection. And what's particularly interesting is a lot is known about the molecular biology of these factors and how they work, but not very much is known about why the pathogens will turn on and off factors in different stages of infection. Um, in terms of dispersal and um, killing the host or not killing the host and that sort of thing. So that's one of the reasons why I think it's such a great subject. Anyway, a long answer, but, but I think it's a great subject. And something that's not getting um, as much attention as it deserves, it could easily be a significant um, puzzle of modern biology. It didn't quite make it into the class, but um, I think it is one of the really big questions because so much work is being done, but it's not integrated into this broader question. Other questions? I have, oh, go ahead. 
Uh, yeah, so I was looking at the uh, plot for the Drosophila death rates, uh, and, and something I noticed from it was that uh, it, it does have that plateau that we were talking about, but it does also seem to just pick up again. So I, I was wondering, is this same behavior where you see the plateau and then you pick up again and then presumably go off to a death rate of one, is that something that's going to be consistently observed across all of these different death processes? Um, I, you know, I'm not familiar with that pattern. Um, you do sometimes see another acceleration, and that's consistent with the argument that there's heterogeneity. And so what you're seeing is the initial ones dying off are a bit more susceptible, and then what you're left with are the, the tough individuals somehow that are a bit bit more resilient, but eventually they're going to get old and die. And so you would see that pick up. And so that would be consistent with the heterogeneity explanation, which you've described. Um, but, you know, I guess, I, I, but I'm not as familiar with that particular aspect. I've looked at a lot of cancer data patterns and you don't, you don't see that so much. Cancer data is a little bit different from mortality. Um, so, it's an interesting aspect of the problem, and I don't, I don't know it entirely. There's, there's even more data on. Well, I, I guess there's more. I would say there's more data on humans probably because we always have a lot of data on humans for things like mortality. So it'd be interesting to look at those curves more carefully. Um, there's people in ecology and evolution department who look a lot at those curves and know a lot about those. So if you're really interested, I can point you to some of that. Other questions? Yeah, go ahead. I, okay. Um, so I was wondering a little bit about um, how we should think of maybe guardrails or um, how we should be careful about not overextending patterns that we find for, um, so for example, like a lot of times, like in philosophy of science, often we talk about like John Stuart Mill, and he has this method of concomitant variation saying that if there is some sort of correlation found, there's probably some sort of link between these two sorts of things. But often nowadays, there's so many, um, at least in like critical thinking classes, right, we talk about so many um, spurious correlations where like these two things end up not being related at all. It's just a coincidence. Yes. And so oftentimes people, if you tell them that there's, a, you know, that things have a similar pattern, then they might be like immediately rejecting like, well, that doesn't mean anything. Um, <laughs> I'm wondering like, there yeah. certainly seems to be like a lot of space between those two things saying that yeah. correlation causes for causes, um, you know, inverse causation. Um, but I'm kind of wondering like what the limits are, where we should be in there. So I was thinking about this because I was thinking of these different patterns of the failure processes and how like cancer and lifespans and mm -hmm. um, automobiles all seem to have this. So I'm just wondering like, what is it all about like the conclusion that we're drawing from it? Like just to say they have the same pattern isn't claiming a whole bunch. It's obvious, right? But the more, um, the more interesting the claim gets, the, you know, more risky it gets, right? So like, I, I don't know. If you're that asking. Makes sense. You're asking the ultimate question, which is how do we figure out causation? Because you. that's what we all want to know, right? And of course, there's lots of. We all know that there's lots of patterns that turn out to be, you know, things that are correlated for reasons that are very distant from what we originally thought or what we were, we were after. Um, I have a very naive, simple answer to that question, which. Um, actually I'd like to talk to you about sometime because I kind of am focused on it myself. And that is that the way we really test causation is what I just say, what I call comparative hypothesis. And I mean that in the simplest way. Um, if I change, if I increase A and I say, I think I understand how this works. So when A increases, I believe that B will increase. And so I look at situations where A increases or I manipulate A to increase. And I find that more often than not, B increases. Then I feel like that's 
a step in the direction of understanding causality, it doesn't prove it. You, ne you never prove causality. So I just, I just, you just give up on that. But on the other hand, you can get strong indications. If you have an a priori reason to believe that an increase in a will cross an increase in b, and then you go ahead and you do it. So to me, this is very important because it also makes the statistics very easy. And in fact, the um, R.A. Fisher basically invented modern statistics. And in his most famous book, on statistics, which was a textbook, which was the dominant textbook in statistics. He starts out the book with a story of the tea tasting lady. Do you get taught the tea tasting lady? You should, because it's the classic statistical story. And he says, OK, there's a lady who says she can tell whether, oh, how does it go? Something like whether you add the milk first and then the tea bag when you make your tea or whether you do it in the reverse order or something like that. And she claims that she can tell the difference. And so you want to know, can she really tell the difference? And so you do an experiment where you randomize the order. And if she can get, if she, if you do five tests with this lady and she correctly identifies the order in which the elements were added to the tea five times in a row, then the probability of doing that by chance is one over two to the fifth, which is 3%. And so by the silly notion that we all use 0.05 for our statistics, this is how you, this is a very easy experiment. If she can do it five times in a row, the probability of doing that by chance is 3%, your p-value you're in. Now I make a joke out of that, but when, when graduate students come to me and they say, I'm doing this experiment and so on and so on, I always ask them, well, do you have a simple comparative hypothesis? And I say, you wanna do that for two reasons because it's very easy to understand and, and it's the only way you understand causality and it makes your statistics very easy. And I, I don't mean that as a joke. I really think that for a lot of the problems that we're raising in this class that are really difficult to get at causality, that the, the only way to do it is really to identify um, simple comparative predictions and data that look at things that way. And when you see people um, developing their experiments and their research plans, they tend to make things very complicated. And so I always ask that question, what, can you give me a simple comparative hypothesis? And usually somewhere in there it, it exists, but people have a very hard time saying it. And I sort of feel like if you can't say what your comparative hypothesis is, you have no chance of success in an evolutionary ecological study because evolutionary ecological studies are highly prone to multiple causations and complexity and correlations that aren't causal and so on. And so it's pretty simple. And, you know, I've read a lot. You, you probably know, you probably have read Judea Pearl's recent work because he's very famous recently on causality, but I'm quite into that also. But I think, I think it all comes down to something very simple. And I'll talk about that a little bit when we talk about metabolism just a little bit. But I think it's really an important thing. We often lose sight. And we, we, we use this principle, but we do it so implicitly that we often have a hard time connecting up what we're doing to it. And I believe that it's at the bottom of almost everything that's successful in sciences that are dependent on trying to work on complex problems, which is almost all of biology. Um, so I went on about that because I believe that if in the end, the only thing you take away from this course is that whenever I'm talking about my own research, I should be able to identify a simple comparative prediction that's at the heart of my research, that that would make the whole course worthwhile. And it's amazing to me that this isn't just brought up over and over and over again at every level of, at all levels of science. But when you look at people who give talks, I bring that up, or when you look at research papers and you say, what's the simple comparative prediction? Sometimes you can find it, but it's amazing how often you can't. And if, and then you can, and then if you do that and you look at the paper, you go, this would be a lot better if the person had just said, Based on what I think is going on here, I believe that as A changes, B will, as A increases, B will increase. And you're like, okay, now we know where we are and now we know how to evaluate what's going on here. And if you can't find that, you'll, you're always gonna be a little bit wondering like what's, what's going on? What's, what's the heart of the matter here? And you have to do it for yourself. Um, so it's, it's one of those things you can practice just like with puzzles. You can practice when you hear a talk, 
when you read a paper, you can say, OK, what's the simple comparative hypothesis here? And you can practice bringing it out. And then you can say, is that really, does that really capture the essence of the issue? And I think you'll be surprised how often it does. That's my claim. So give it a test and see what you think. Uh, Steve, may I? Well, this just follow, so is that, um, did that answer your question sufficiently? Is, it, is that a sufficient yeah. answer? Yes, thank you very much. OK, go ahead, Aiden. Sorry. Yeah. I was thinking that uh, at, at least interpreting what you said at, at face value, and uh, I'd be happy uh, to, to have you correct me or to append more. A comparative hypothesis in general is not going to be sufficient for causation. Uh, right. In the sense of just the example you gave, uh, Fisher's uh, tea taster. Right. We can find those relationships where we have a comparative hypothesis. In that case, we set up the null, right, yes. where uh, she's guessing a chance and the alternative uh, where she's doing better than chance. Yes. Uh, and we can find all sorts of these associations that are quite significant and they're very closely tied. Yes. Uh, but they would still be associations. Right. And, and right uh, off of what you said from from Pearl's work, we know uh, that we need something like interventions or screening off relationships. We need to yes. either through a uh, manipulation of the system, as, as you've mentioned, be able to change the one thing, right? So that we can attribute a change in the outcome variables to a change in, in our intervention. Uh, uh, or, you know, do kind of uh, thoughtful math that identifies the right sorts of uh, conditional independence relation that again tells us uh, something more than what even a very strong correlation could tell us. Because you're, I mean, it's absolutely right that a very neat correlation is suggestive of uh, sometimes uh, at the least a recent common cause, but uh, or one that wasn't diluted too strongly through a causal chain. But right, it, it, it seems like the, the comparative hypothesis is insufficient to get us really to causation. Um, yeah, the answer is yes. I think that all of the various literature aspects that you discuss, which I think are very, which are very important, I, I believe very deeply, and I, I think all roughly reduced. So I'm very, I'm very big on trying to reduce things to something extremely. I, I like to make things. I like to see how far I can go. So I'm going to push things to be simple, and I'm always going to try to make things so simple that I'll often go over the edge because I think you have to go too far to know what far enough is. And so what I would say to that is that what you really want to do is measure is is increase a over the greatest range of alternative background conditions, which is what randomization is, right? The ultimate is a randomized controlled trial, which breaks the other causal links. But you can break those other causal links by increasing a over the widest range of conditions that you can possibly do. And the wider the range of conditions that you look at, the closer you approach the ideal of breaking those other causal links. So that's just a long way of saying test a comparative hypothesis and increase A over the widest range of conditions that you're able to do, ideally random, randomizing over other conditions, but you can't often achieve that ideal in real life. So you just try to do it over the most conditions and intuitively people understand that. And I think that is the essence of all of the complex mathematical and and logical discussions that go on about causation reduced to comparison and widest range of conditions. And there isn't really anything else, although all the details matter a lot when you're really analyzing problems and working through things. But you have to always remember what's at the bottom of these things. Um, if you remember what's at the bottom of those things, then in your daily life as a practicing scientist, it's often impossible to keep track of all of these fine notions, but you can keep track of those basic principles. And it can really inform how you go about explaining things to other people in simple ways that they can easily grasp in relation to your research. And also how you make decisions about what experiments you do and how you set up your experiments. You know, in real time in science, things are complicated and, you, and things go fast and you just don't have time often to, 
to do perf to do things perfectly. But you have time, I think, to think these things through. If you if you know what the simplest basic principles are that you have to keep in mind. So that's that's kind of my take on it. But I'd be happy to discuss that and argue with you, probably not in class, but at some other time, because I'm, I'm quite interested in this myself. And, and I think it, there's a lot to learn and I'm still learning about it. But I, I've kind of have settled on this position for now in relation to practically dealing with the complexities of daily life in biology. Um, yeah, that, that's really helpful. I, I'd mentioned as a very brief aside that I'm uh, writing an article right now in which I claim randomization uh, does not play the role we think it does in randomized controlled trials. And the Bayesian analysis uh, suggests that our, our classical explanations for what it, it's doing are, are not right. And so that might be fun to, that, that yeah, sounds I'd like the kind to of thing you'd be interested in. Yeah, I'd love to talk to you about that actually and look at it. I've, I've always, you know, I the randomized controlled trial obviously has Good, good things about it, but I, I still feel what I said is almost closer to what you really need in practice, although what I said is a bit vague, which is you really just want to get it um, tested over the most conditions, different conditions that are re in related to what you're interested in, and that will tend to break the causal links that you can't see or that you can't measure most strongly. Randomization is just, one never achieves it anyway, and so it's just kind of some ideal notion that you do when you're doing, you know, computer experiment or something. Um, I mean, you do, maybe that's not quite right. In the history of, of statistics, randomization played a great role for a good reason. But um, anyway, we've probably already, for class time, probably already covered that enough. But I, th I think those are um, really central issues. So those are great. Other questions? So when I when I was trying to write my puzzle over the weekend, I was really grappling with what's the difference between a puzzle and a question. <laughs> and uh, of course, I think the answer there seems like uh, an expectation of you what you think is going to go on, and that to me was the hardest part to try and convey. Like what what is the expectation which with these observations conflict. Um, and it occurred to me that in the great puzzles of the history of physics, it seems much easier looking back on it because the expectation is in fact mathematically formalized. And so you write down what you think the orbit of Mercury is, and then it's slightly off and you say, oh, well, there's a puzzle there. And then you get general relativity, right? Just the way that it is. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, the yeah, his, his, history is very, um, it's very informative, but also very misleading when you try to compare that to your daily life. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. Some, because biology is complex, it seems like it might be hopeless to have mathematical formalization of expectations. I was wondering what you what you think about that. Well, I tend to, I, I am not by accident that I emphasize comparative predictions. So for example, um, think about growth rate of bacteria versus what I call yield, which is the number of grams of biomass produced by a bacterial population per gram of sugar input, that would be yield. Um, we can make a very simple comparative prediction that arises from mathematical theory about what we expect with growth rate versus yield in bacterial growth, which is that if you grow bacteria alone in a culture, and then you compete, let's say you grow bacteria in isolation, and you have a bunch of replicate populations all growing in isolation. And then at the end of a period of growth, you sample the populations in proportion to their population sizes. And then you use those samplings to form the next generation. Okay, so that's a mathematical structure that we can analyze. When you do that, you tend to favor, um, and suppose that you start each population with a fixed amount of sugar, 
and the populations grow until all the sugar is used up. So that's the scenario. Again, so that's a set of assumptions. We can analyze this mathematically. What you select for under that situation is high yield because you're selecting for the biggest population size, which means transforming the given sugar into the most number of cells. And if you give the cells a lot of time, then it doesn't matter how fast they do it. So you don't select for growth rate at all. Now take exactly that same scenario, but instead of growing each bacterial population as an isolated clone, put in two different genotypes to start with in each, in each local um, growth chamber. Now the particular genotype which grows faster is going to consume the sugar faster than the other genotype. And so at the end of the growth phase, the faster growing genotype is going to be more frequent, right? Okay. Now when you sample, it's a faster growing type, and, but it has a lower yield. So the total population size of that growth chamber is smaller, but the particular genotype that we're looking at is in higher frequency. And so what happens when you compete clones directly in that way, different genotypes, is you select for high growth rate, even though it reduces the total productivity of the group and reduces the total number of cells produced. Because now you've got two levels of selection. You've got competition within the, the chamber and competition between chambers. Or what I like to say is, well, let's just say it that way for now. Um, so then you come to a mathematical, a prediction that derives from mathematics, which is comparative, which is the greater the competition between distinct genotypes, the greater the growth, the greater the selection for growth rate and the less the selection for yield. That's a comparative prediction. We can test by looking at different degrees of mixture. So now we have a fundamental prediction about genetic structure of populations in relation to two of the most important parameters of fitness, which are growth rate and fecundity or yield. And we've made a strong comparative hypothesis that we can test empirically. And I would claim that, and, and you can test this hypothesis and, and basically what I just said works, which is that if you look at greater mixtures of genotype on average, will tend to favor higher growth rates and greater isolation of genotypes on average will tend to favor higher yield and reduce growth rates. It's a comparative prediction that derives from the math. Now, if you make a math, the problem with biology and mathematical models is that people trained in mathematics always want to do the following. They want to make a model of what is the growth rate? Is it 2.74? Is it 2.96? I want to measure the parameters. I want to measure the growth rate. It's math, right? We need numbers. As soon as you do that, you're screwed. Biology doesn't like that. You're not, you're not going to get anywhere that way in biology unless you control everything so perfectly that basically you've turned the organisms into a little calculator, which you can do in the lab. If you control everything about bacterial growth and inputs and so on, sometimes, although not always, you can actually achieve a situation where the bacteria are just doing your calculations for you. But that's, you know, and it, it works sometimes. But then you've just, what you've done there is you've proved your ability as an experimenter to control everything. You haven't really learned that much about the biology of the organism. Um, so this ties the notion of comparison into the notion of mathematical theory and how you actually use mathematical theory and biology successfully. So remember in cancer, what I told you is that um, when we looked at the inherited cases versus the sporadic cases, I predicted a rise in incidence and a decrease in yield. Those are comparative predictions. I'm sorry, a rise in incidence and a decrease in the slope of the incidence curve. And mathematically, that's exactly what comes out of a multi-stage failure process. If you knock out a step, a protection of a body, of an electronic component that has multiple protections, and you look at the failure curve, you expect a rise in, in the incidence of failure, obviously, but you expect a decline in the slope of the failure curve. This is a very strong prediction of the mathematical theory, and we see it borne out in complex cancers, some of the most beautiful studies in the history of cancer research, 
And you can do the same thing with electronic components and with other things. It's a comparative prediction. On the other hand, if you, if you want to tell me what's the slope, is it 1.74 or is it going to be 1.97? I would tell you that that's, that's a question for a computer simulation. You're not going to, you're not going to get that. But that's what most people who do mathematical theory end up wanting and, and insisting on. Maybe it comes from physics envy, but in biology, you don't get that. So actually, the mathematical theory is extremely powerful. And the puzzle, getting back to your original question, the puzzle comes from the degree of surprise. Surprise is the most fundamental notion of information and inference in all of science. If you trace back all the formal notions of information theory and all the formal notions of inference, they all fundamentally come down to some interpretation of the meaning of surprise. So my use of puzzles and, and calling things surprising isn't something that's arbitrary. In fact, there is no notion of information, inference, um, and so on in doing science without a, without a real deep notion of surprise. Now, you can be surprised for the wrong reasons, but being surprised for the wrong reasons and studying that teaches you that you were wrong, that your thinking was wrong. So that's actually how you make progress. You know, things can be surprising because you don't know what you're talking about, or they can be surprising because um, in the current context of understanding, that's just where we are. But the ultimate answer to your question is it's hard, you know. Yeah. If if you could if you could identify what the great puzzles are in the world around you, you would be absolutely one of the best scientists in your field. It's obviously not easy to do. We have a very hard time seeing ahead because the whole point is that you know we don't know what's surprising. We haven't quite tuned ourselves in. Historically, it's very easy. Currently, it's almost impossible. This is why teaching it and discussing it's such a hard thing. But your question is just right. When you actually come to do it yourself, it's all of a sudden it's not so easy. So if you feel that, then you, I think you're you're thinking the right way. If you think it's easy, then I'm worried. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, I, I like the idea of comparison as the the goal of making of doing math. Um, I guess I would add qualitative behaviors over ranges of parameters as another um, way that I think about it. But, I think it's the same yeah. thing when you get down to it. Qualitative behavior is, is trend and range of behavior is comparison. So I think it's roughly the same, maybe not exactly, but it's pretty close. So I agree with you, yeah. but I don't think cool. it's so different from what I, just a different language. Gotcha. But I think it's the same thing. So I think that we're tuned in on that one. Cool, thanks. Anyone else? Yeah, I just had one. Uh, oh, sorry. You go ahead. You go I just have one question that's sort of related to like the um, growth versus yield, and it's the protein limitation. Can you sort of explain that a little more? Because you're saying as um, there's more proteins used to digest food, there's fewer proteins available for growth. But aren't these like different genes involved in these different processes? So is it if they're like competing for substrates or binding partners or something, or does it have something to do with like the free pool of amino acids or ATP? Yeah, well, actually, that's um, that's a that's sort of towards the end of our discussion of of overflow metabolism. I'm gonna I'll talk about that. But the the idea is it's it's called the proteome limitation I, hypothesis. And the idea is that cells have a limited number of proteins, and um, proteins are catalysts. So nothing happens without the proteins to drive it. And if you devote um, more proteins to throughput, metabol catabolic throughput, you know, breaking food down, then you have fewer proteins to build up cells, to build up new cells. And so there's essentially there's a, you, you, essentially you have to allocate your limited proteome. Now you could say, well, why don't you just make more proteins? Proteome doesn't have to be limited, but if you're gonna then make more proteins, then you're taking away from growth to make more proteins. And so there's, ultimately there's a trade-off that flows through proteins because proteins are what makes things happen. And um, there's one there's one paper in particular that's a really good one. 
that maybe I maybe I cited and mentioned by uh, Bassan et al. from Terry Waz lab in, in 2015, which is, uh, I think, one of the better papers written about overflow metabolism. I have a lot of alternative views against that paper, but I but that's actually because it's a very good paper. It's really an excellent paper. It does the ideal description of this constraint notion. I think constraint a constraint notion of how we understand uh, physiological characters. And I, I think that it takes that constraint notion and does an almost perfect job of looking at it. My criticism of it is that um, constraints are not the only thing that determine what cells look like and how um, organisms are designed. And so we'll possibly talk about that towards the end of our discussion of overflow metabolism. So uh, that's a central question. I don't know how close I came to giving you a partial answer, but. It was mostly just like what is being taken away exactly um, from some things that allow it to go higher? Is it like free amino acids kind of thing? Or why can't they both be highly expressed at the same time? Like what's the basis of trade-offs, I guess? Trade-offs between what? Or just like, um, so if you're having high growth um, you'll have low yield of metabolism or whatever. But oh, well, that's a, yeah, that's both. a more, okay, that's a different, sub, let's, um, mostly I'm going to delay that question, but the issue there is really a, there's, there's somewhat of a thermodynamic aspect to that, which is that the faster metabolic, the faster a chemical reaction goes, the more of the driving force goes to, to rate and the less of the driving force is available to be captured for other things. And that's really the central point of my entire discussion of overflow metabolism that I prepared that we'll get to as soon as we're done with questions. Uh, well, not too long after we get done, I have one other thing to mention. So let's um, hold that and then definitely bring it up again because I think my description won't answer the question fully, but it'll give us the background that's necessary to give a good answer to that question. So it's a central question. And you really, I think you're really putting your finger, you're right to, to want to know about that. But there's some things that we can only really say effectively after I show you some other things first. Okay. So I'd rather, I'd rather do that in the context of what I prepared, but definitely bring it up again. Okay, cool, thank you. Yeah, crucial question. Okay. Yeah, there was only uh, yeah one minor thing was I was appreciating the conversation about uh, a precise notion of surprisal, and this was something that came to me when you first uh, mentioned it. Right? Can we characterize puzzles uh, uh, precisely? And I wanted to hear your thoughts and if they lined up uh, with what first occurred to me, which is that uh, there are in fact, notions, uh, as you say, in uh, information theory that seem to capture this idea pretty precisely and uh, such that if we were to give it to, say, an artificial agent investigating science on our behalf, we might have it looking at uh, the uh, a, a Bayesian or information theoretic notion of the expected information of an investigation. You might think of it as, uh, as it was identifying potential questions to investigate puzzles would correspond to those that would exhibit high entropy. They're the random variables such that investigation from them relative to the background probability distribution of our current beliefs, right, uh, would exhibit high entropy and therefore high uh, uh, informativeness if we're going to go learn from them. And I was like, that seems like a very kind of precise articulation of the notion of a puzzle that we're speaking of informally. And I was wondering if that lined up with how you were thinking. Um. I have to, let me answer in two ways. I think with regard to this course, which is mostly about biology, I'm not too concerned about that issue. But on the other hand, I'm ex I think that, that no the notions that you discussed are some of the most interesting. They really tie to my great fascination with what I called common patterns. And the really at the heart of probability theory and what pattern is and how we understand it and the notions of invariance. So I would love to talk to you about that, but I think we're not going to take that up in this class, because those are really um, great questions. And I think that would be a great topic for a course. But um, we're going to use the notions of surprise and puzzles in almost more or less an everyday way. Um, 
and we're not going to really deal with those, except maybe towards the end of the class, if we come back to common patterns, then we'll come back to those issues. Um, and then we'll connect them up to some biological things. So I'm not going to answer the question because it's such a good question that it's really at the heart of um, really the foundations of much of the conceptual foundations of much of modern science and, and mathematics and philosophy really come into these issues. Um, and they're topics that I love very much, but, but you have to draw the line somewhere. And so for this class, I'm going to, unless there turns out to be at some point in the class that, that there's a lot of people in the class that would like to take this up, then I'll be happy to do it. Um, I think it's fantastic stuff, but we're going to talk about metabolism. Um, don't stop, don't, don't quit asking questions just because I put you off on things like that. I think it's really great. And I hear these things and I, I, I store them as I won't lose them, but I will occasionally not follow up on things. Okay, we're good. So the first thing we're going to do, because um, the first week of class, we gave a very broad, extremely quick overview of different topics, and I'm not going to repeat all of them, that ideally we'll discuss during the class. Probably we won't get to all of those topics, but I wanted, so that's one of the reasons why at the very beginning of the class, I just wanted to give you just a huge range of things to just think about and, and, and know that I think these are interesting things. And so I'm going to do one more set of things, which I hope we'll be able to do fairly quickly, and then we'll move on to metabolism. And so let's see if I can do this in about 10 or 15 minutes. You never know. And so we're going to relate three things very quickly. And the first one is one of the great classic problems in immunology. And now we're using this historical tool again, where we look at the history of a subject and we ask about what were some of the great problems in the history of some of the big subjects and how did they get solved? Because we can still learn a lot, even though it doesn't help us necessarily figure out what puzzles are today. It still teaches us a lot about the history of these subjects. And so in immunology, historically, one of the really great puzzles was how can a body like ours or any vertebrate recognize so many different molecules? So a molecule that's foreign, we call it an antigen. That just means a foreign molecule. And our bodies can recognize, it seems almost like an un, almost an unlimited number of foreign molecules. And it must be so that our body doesn't have enough genes to encode all of that information. We can't have a gene for every molecule that we can recognize. And so somehow our bodies are recognizing and learning. And we also know that when you get um, attacked by particular antigens, your body can learn to recognize it. And then it can often remember that it's been attacked by that or that antigen has been present before. And then when you challenge a body a second time, say a year or two later, that your body responds very quickly. It has a memory. So it's, these are all classic problems. This is perception, categorization, learning and memory. And the people who were immunologists in the first half of the 20th century, they were just like, how can this possibly be? And, you know, and the two dominant theories were really sort of the two classic ideas in, in learning, which is one idea is, is what's called instruction, which is basically the idea is that your body has kind of a, a moldable molecule and an antigen comes in and it has a particular shape and your body's molecule can kind of match up to that shape and take a little impression of it. It can be instructed, literally instructed by the challenge. And then somehow after this malleable molecule takes a particular shape, that that shape can be remembered. And so that's classically in learning theory, that's called instructionism, instructionalism or something like that. And so the notion is that information can be transferred to a, an organism or a learner by direct impression or instruction. And obviously that's a very attractive solution in some ways, because that kind of solves the puzzle, right? You just have to have a nice little malleable form, and then some way of remembering when you form a shape. Um, it's easy to understand intuitively, 
although hard to think about how it works molecularly. And, and that's kind of where the field was. And then there's the other alternative, which is trial and error, which is also in terms of learning, the other great um, class of learning models are trial and error models. And trial and error is just like natural selection or any sort of trial and error, which is that somehow guesses are made, trials are made, guesses are made about what the solution is or what the molecule is that needs to be recognized. And that the trials have to be made in a manner that's partially uncorrelated with the target. Otherwise, it's not a trial. If you make a guess that's directly at the trial, that's actually instructionism. You're tuning into what's coming in and you're fitting it. So a trial has to be making guesses that are at least partly uncorrelated with the target. And then you have to have some mechanism to tell whether you're closer, whether your trials are closer or further away. That's the error. You have to be able to measure the error. Are you close? Are you far apart? And so trial and error is the other great possibility. But then the question is, how does your body come up with a trial and error mechanism to recognize foreign molecules of any sort, not any sort, but of a wide variety of sorts? I mean, that's just almost as, as hard as it is to imagine instructionism. I think intuitively, it's even harder to imagine trial and error. But the answer historically was trial and error. And the answer historically, the answer biologically is trial and error. Your body has a built-in mechanism of generating partially randomly molecules that are can recognize antigens and make a huge number of these different anti, these different um, recognition forms. Excuse me. And then your body has a way of recognizing of selecting among those forms when a new antigen comes in as to which one's the best match. And your immune system has basically an incredibly beautiful, highly tuned trial and error system. Now trial and error is just natural selection. Your body basically has, has a built-in form of, of running natural selection within your body on incoming molecules by making alternative genotypes of cells and then running a selective system on it. And it's just an incredible thing. And this is really one of the main aspects of the adaptive immune system, as it's called. And so that's one of the great puzzles in terms of information. And you see here the solution is trial and error, and you have a regulatory mechanism. Now what I'm going to do is just leave that, because that's by itself a very interesting problem. And although we know the solution, it leads to lots of interesting problems and a lot of the history of immunology is really around that solution. And then the second thing I'm going to come up, I'm going to discuss is a little bit vaguer, but in some ways to me more interesting. And what I'd like to say is that the puzzle here is why are eukaryotic genomes overwired? And by that, I mean that if you look at the control of gene expression in a eukaryotic cell, there are a huge number of factors that determine whether a gene is expressed. There's microRNAs, there's transcription factors, there's introns and splicing. If you know about modern work, you know that the spatial arrangement of the DNA is in strongly influencing how genes are turned on and off. And it seems like every year, if you read the literature, people discover yet another factor which modulates the expression of genes. And there's just this huge list of factors. And that's a bit of a puzzle because if you were an engineer and you were building a control system, because after all, this is a control system to, to regulate the expression of a gene. If you were building a control system, you would not build a system that just has a huge density of wires coming from everywhere where everything influences everything else. But that's really what the genome looks like, sort of. And so I call that overwiring. So why is the genome overwired? And there's two, two aspects to that question or puzzle, if you want to say. One is, what are the forces that led to the overwiring historically in terms of evolutionary history? And the second question is, what's the consequence of that overwiring 
in terms of how cells will, will respond to inputs and outputs and how cells will evolve in the future. Because that wiring really changes how evolutionary change in the future is going to happen. Because the evolutionary change has to happen by changes in the wiring process that change gene expression. So this becomes then central to thinking about evolutionary change in the future. And so those are two different questions, but they're obviously closely related. How did the overwiring come to be? And what are the consequences over, the, over that overwiring? And I think you need to, we need to think about, in order to tie to our third aspect, we need to think about the wiring as thinking about what is, what is really going on here. Is cells taking information through sensors? And those sensors trigger various cascades through this wiring network of gene expression. And so you've got this, this network that's transmitting signals. And those signals are influencing genes that turn on and off and then become signals themselves. And eventually, then, we have some sort of output that we can measure, like the cell moves in a particular direction, or the cell opens or closes its pores on, on the membrane surface. And so we've got inputs. We've got an internal wiring thing where signals are passing through. And we've got outputs. Okay. We'll keep that in mind. And then the third thing we're going to talk about is deep learning, which is at the heart of modern artificial intelligence and really at the sort of heart of what's the revolution that's going on in modern science and modern life. And I want to connect those things up and talk about how there's some really interesting similarities, I think, in, in the kinds of questions and puzzles that are, are going on. Now, these are ongoing puzzles. And so when you have ongoing puzzles, things are always a bit vaguer and a little harder to specify. But I think I can show you the relationship between these puzzles, which in a way that's very interesting. So we'll um, take a 10 minute break, which means we'll start at 11.02. So be back a minute or two before that. As always, you can turn off your camera, but I recommend that you don't, that you stay in the meeting, don't leave. Because um, if you leave and you can't get back in, I probably won't see you again today. So um, we'll take a break and I'll see you in a few minutes. 